This is Nicola Morgan and the following 20 minutes is an edited version of an interview I had with John Harding, um, author of Florence and Giles, talking about that novel and particularly the language of Florence, Florence speak as he calls it, and also his creative writing processes. Just to set the scene for those of you who don't know Florence and Giles, and I really, really do hope that you all go away and read it, it's a book I absolutely love, um, I thought I'd read you the back of the book, the blurb. 1891, in a crumbling New England mansion, 12-year-old orphan Florence and her younger brother Giles are neglected by their guardian uncle. Banned from reading, Florence devours books in secret and twists words and phrases into a language uniquely her own. After the violent death of the children's first governess, a second arrives. Florence becomes convinced she is a vengeful and malevolent spirit who means to do Giles harm. Against a powerful enemy, with no adult to turn to for help, Florence will need all her intelligence and ingenuity to save Giles and preserve her private world. This is her chilling tale. John and I talked for about an hour, but I've just um, selected a couple of sections from the conversation, um, particularly about the Florence Speak. And just to show you what Florence Speak is like, um, to set the scene for our conversation, um, I want just to read the first paragraph of the book. The whole story is told through Florence's voice. It is a curious story I have to tell, one not easily absorbed and understood, so it is fortunate I have the words for the task. If I say so myself, who probably shouldn't, for a girl my age I am very well worded, exceeding well worded, to speak plain. But because of the strict views of my uncle regarding the education of females, I have hidden my eloquence under a bushel dit and kept any but the simplest forms of expression bridewelled within my brain. Such concealment has become my habit, and began on account of my fear, my very great fear, that were I to speak as I think, it would be obvious I had been at the books, and the library would be banned. And as I explained to poor Miss Whittaker, it was shortly before she tragicked upon the lake, that was a thing I did not think I could bear. My first question to John was about how Florence Speak came, how easy it was for him to um, learn to write it. And he began his answer um, talking about another original language, a, a language he'd created in um, his first novel, One Big Damn Puzzler. And then this was what he had to say. So I've always been quite obsessed with Shakespeare. And I, I guess really with One Big Damn Puzzler, I was trying to translate... Uh, Hamlet into Pigeon English because I really felt I should have written Hamlet <laughs> and I would like to have written it and this is the nearest I was going to get and I guess with with Florence and Giles having having had that experience with One Big Damn Puzzler uh, the language I created there was basically grammatical, the, the main difference between it and normal English was grammatical and so with, with Florence and Giles it's actually with words themselves that I've changed. And the great thing is that Shakespeare is credited with having created more words in the English language than any other person. Partly that's because so much of him survived from a, a time when the language was still evolving and new words were being created, and probably a lot of other people created new words, but they didn't get the credit because their works haven't survived. But nevertheless, one of the great things about Shakespeare was his ability to twist and bend words. And I've always kind of thought in a language where I have played with words in my own head and I don't know if other people do that but I've always done it and really I decided that Florence would have to have a language of her own that, that, that would make her much more immediate to the reader and it really started when I, I was trying to write the first page of the book and I always think the first page of a book is very important because it sets the tone mm. for the book yeah. and if you struggle to get that then you struggle with the book uh, with Florence Florence, it came out in that first page and after about three or four paragraphs I knew I was Florence, I knew I had her, I knew the book would write itself, it would get written, you know, I didn't have any doubt about whether it would get written or not. Um, I had a doubts about whether anybody would read this language or like it or anything, but, um, and it really started with one phrase which I remember very well, which was uh, where she talks about her thoughts being bridewelled within her brain mm. and of course a bridewell is an archaic uh, word for a prison and it's a noun and she's using it as a verb 
and this is something that Shakespeare does all the mm. time. He, he, you, and a lot of his new uses of words, which have now passed into the language, are words that were at his time only nouns that he also made into verbs and vice versa. And when I got that with, with Florence, I guess Brideworld within my brain told me lots of things about her. It told me, first of all, that she was a child who had secrets that were locked inside of her. It, it told me that she made up words. And she'd also used this archaic word, so it told me that she was at the same time very well read. And so, really from that one phrase, um, not even the most memorable phrase of Florence speak in the whole book, um, the, the, the language began to evolve. And then I, I grew to love it as it evolved. I didn't, with One Big Damn Puzzle, with the Pigeon English, I had to keep constantly going back and revising the language to make sure it was consistent and that it worked um, because it was so reliant on its own grammar. With, with Florence, it, it just grew and grew and grew and I didn't really have any difficulty with sticking to a, a particular language. It just evolved naturally and I found it was much easier to say I downstairs instead mm. of I went downstairs mm. or I long corridor instead of I made my way along the long corridor. And um, she obvious. I love, I, love it. I love the bit about she obvious and, and the tragic as well. Those yes. Are, those are my favourite ones. <laughs> yes. And it, 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 just, it just really evolved mm. naturally from itself and I love the, the other thing it gave me was the playfulness of it. It gave me a playful side to Florence because she's she could have been in this very serious door child in this awful situation that she found herself in but uh, because Shakespeare uses language playfully he uses puns and made up words playfully and this was a this actually gave Florence this humorous playful side which I, I think makes her a much more rounded appealing character and I, I guess reflects part of my character as mm. well what about your own experience of reading as a child, your own experience of, of books and <laughs> well, classics as a child? Uh, this, is, this is one of the funny things that, that I only discovered about a year after the book had been published um, because I, th I thought there was very little that was autobiographical in it, which just shows you how wrong you can be about thinking anything is never, ever non-autobiographical. But I grew up in uh, a council house where we had about four books and... Um, that, that was my only contact with books uh, at home. But I went to a little village school. Uh, my mother was a school cleaner. And uh, every day my mother would arrive at three o'clock when all the other kids went home and I would stay with her. And so what I would do there was read. So I did actually read all the books in the school long before I was old enough to read most of them in class. I'd, I'd, sort of worked my way through them because I had a good couple of hours every day when I was just reading these books. And I, I did have a sense of wonder at discovering these books and I think Florence's sense of wonder at arriving in this library and finding all these books and this whole world of the imagination there and all of these stories lined up there was, reflects the, the sense of wonder I had. But uh, one thing that I realised after I was just talking to some kids uh, giving a talk at a school and I re remembered suddenly that um, my mother had always told me not to always be very careful to put the books back where I'd found them. And that was, that was because for some reason my mother thought um, she or I would get into trouble with the teachers um, if they found out I'd been reading them because they'd probably have been delighted, but my mother was probably a bit paranoid about losing her job. So I, I was always really careful to put them back. I remember I used to, what I used to do was, when I took a book off the shelf, I'd pull the one next to it out so I'd know exactly where I had to put it back. And that's reflecting what Florence does. She's very careful about not being caught because she, she realises that if she's caught reading, then she'll be banned from the library and the books will be taken away from her. So um, she's very careful about putting... And so all of that had come from somewhere deep within me, some, something that I didn't even know I'd, I'd remembered. And um, I think, I, think uh, I had, because of that, I had this appreciation of the, the secret nature of reading books, that it was done as a secret pleasure and a guilty pleasure. And I think that, that's, that all came out in Florence, really. I'm going to split the recording into two halves. So this is the end of part one. And part two of the interview will resume with a separate recording called John Harding, interviewed by Nicola Morgan, part two. <laughs>